Hello. This I am here with Reverend Dr. Leslie Duraso. Hi, Leslie. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you for inviting me. Um, Leslie has a bachelor, a BA in psychology from York College, um, which is the City University of New York, and has and was awarded a Master of Divinity and Doctor Doctorate of Ministry from New York Theological Seminary. Yes. And you have been the minister at Hamptons United Methodist Church in Southampton for 10 years. All correct. So you know the area. You know your, you know everybody out here by this point. You know all the players. And we are in the midst of a pandemic and a horrible race. Yeah. I don't even know what you call it. Maybe an illumination of what has been happening for 400 years. Right. For maybe having a little boiling point. So <laughs> I wanted, and I know you wanted to talk um, about the importance of, um, as you wrote to me, tearing down certain ideologies and or, or understanding about racism. Right. Um, do you have anything you want to start with about living here or do you want to just go right into the meat of where we are? Um, I'll talk a little bit about living here because um, I think it'll all tie in. Okay. So I'm a Queens girl, so more of like a city girl. Um, so coming out here was very disruptive in many ways, good ways, but also in not so good ways in regards to how I understood um, to live my life and how I was as a person because it's so it can be so radically different. Right. Um, and so unfortunately, coming here um, to, to start moving a little bit towards the times we're in now, um, I would say, um, you know, you really had to, I had to wrestle a little bit with what they call subliminals, um, understanding of how small communities or small towns might work. Um, and with that, I would say that um, I was confronted with what I considered um, bigotry or biases. Um, probably can even go further to say some racist understanding um, because I came to uh, this community as the minister for the United Methodist Church, and it's called a cross-cultural appointment, meaning yeah. that probably no one in the church would look like me and my family, <laughs> right? So, and, that, and that's exactly pretty much what it was. I, I, we were the Black family coming into a pretty much all-white congregation. The congregation was like 98% white. We made it, we had a few Hispanics and then other Asians or from other spaces. Um, and so that was a very challenging um, experience for me because I was never really put in that kind of setting before. And unfortunately, in many ways, um, all that I shared um, sort of started happening in my life and coming forth right in front of my face. and. When it's happening, I just feel like most of us initially maybe don't see it like that because we don't want to see it that way. But then people start saying things um, and then they start stop participating and um, you know supporting you. Then you sort of understand what it is. Actually, um, I guess it really hit home for me when I found out a petition was sent to my superiors to actually remove me from the church within my first year there. Wow. So um, your first year. So as anybody knows who started a job where they're basically, as I know, the executive director, what I was, or a, a right. year is nothing. Right. You can barely do anything in a year. And you certainly right. don't even almost know your job in a year. I mean, not, you know what I mean? The, it yeah. takes a long time in a leadership position to definitely get you. And um, I, I was really naive because um, as a minister, I think as many pastors, you know, you always give people the benefit of the doubt. You always want to see the good and the greatness in the people. Um, so I was extremely shocked that a petition was put out against me to remove me. I, I had, for me, I had no signals. I thought I was still like on a honeymoon period. <laughs> um, I felt like things were going pretty well. And so that really, you know, shook me up because I was like, I, I was just so caught off guard. I felt like I was blindsided actually. Um, and then now move a little full for, forward to now. Um, I'm actually, this is my last month really here at Hamptons United Methodist Church. It is. Uh, 
I yes. Yes. So I had I no did, idea about that. I'm so glad we're doing this. <laughs> yes. I I was my bishop in the cabinet have appointed me to another church. And um currently I'm going to Westchester County and Bronx, New York. And um again, that felt like a blind side. I was blindsided again because one, I hadn't asked to be removed. Uh, my congregation didn't ask for me to be removed, but it is the policy or understanding of United Methodist Church that you're only appointed on a yearly basis, an annual okay. basis. So at any point they can say, you know what, we think you should move. And, um, and I understood that and I signed up for that. But this was taking place, like I was informed of this two weeks into the pandemic. Wow. And everybody was confused. People weren't understanding what was going on. I wasn't understanding what was going on, you know, totally. I had to figure out how to re-event and do church um, virtually and still stay in touch with people virtually. So it was just, everything was new. And um, I just really felt that even now, so I, I'm, and, and, you know, it's, I put it out there because I clear we want to believe or think that sometimes things are just what they are and they don't have any racial undertones or underpinnings in it. Um, but I will share the United Methodist Church, although I'm glad I am a part of the United Methodist Church, um, in its structure, it's, it's, it's kind of racist um, in, in the sense that this is a denomination where um, most of the clergy and administrators of it are, are Caucasian. Um, and so when you have that kind of system in place and whether it's the fault or not of anyone, but there's, there's a lot of disparities that come out of there. For instance, um, like myself and other black clergy, they will send us into all spaces to be ministers, mm -hmm. but they won't send my white counterparts or colleagues in black or brown communities to minister. Hmm. Right. So, uh, so when you do a really a historical study of that, you know, cross cultural appointment, what does that really mean? So we're vulnerable enough, and we're or we're, ex, you know, we're able to fit into any spaces and places, and 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 not that these places aren't good, and not that they don't benefit right. us, but there, when you look at the statistics, black and brown persons, especially females, go into all spaces but that's not the same thing happening. So what I want to try to move to is understanding when I say racism or racist ideologies, you know, this is really saying that um, all humans are not created equally, right? It's based upon this untruth that all humans are not created equally. And because of this untruth that really affords others greater opportunities it's systemic, you know, it has to go throughout everything we understand. And that's what's so hard about this, right? Because you sort of grow up um, and, and many of our parents and people will say, you know, I wasn't, I didn't grow, you know, I didn't know to be racist. I didn't see color and things like that. And that may be true, but that's how, what I, for lack of a better term, um, poignant, or sne poignant or sneaky racism is because it's so built in the system that you don't even, you don't even recognize that you're um, um, entertaining or being involved in a racist system that's already in place. And so how do you tear down that kind of structure and understanding, especially in the here and now, you know, because everyone's asking, you know, what can I do? You know, I think this is horrible and it's been going on for too long. And I'm in agreement, but I'm also a realist. Um, um, uh, it, I would hope that it wouldn't take another 400 years or so, but I'm not convinced um, that much will happen. I am convinced that progress will be made. I am convinced that um, change will happen this time. And that's mainly has to do with the um, younger generation. Uh, because I think they, they, I think in some ways we did a good job with them. Mm -hmm. Right, get a better job with them and understanding of being receptive to other people, and a lot of that has to do with social media and technology. Right, they can stay, they can live in one area, but they can see the whole world. They can see how other parts of the world and the country are operating, and that influences them greatly, and it helps to lessen that divide and that separation. 
So, but here, when you come back to smaller communities, often it can look um, racism has a different kind of look to it, right? Because everybody sort of grew up together. Um, we went to school together. Mm -hmm. Everyone was welcome in my home. And that's all true and that's all great, but that doesn't mean those systems weren't in place working against some of some people, um, which tends to- Do you think that being an outsider who comes into a small community anyway, and then you add to that that you're an outsider outsider? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yes, I, I know exactly. <laughs> One of the first greetings I got, I received when I came here was, well, you know, you will never be considered a local. Right. Yeah. You have to be here for 50 years or more. <laughs> I just make it apparently. <laughs> I'm born and raised. But what a welcome. What a welcome. So basically yeah, no, right. trying to tell me I'm never going to really be in here. I'm never going to really belong. Right. right. So, so let's be clear. Right. So, and that may not have had to do anything with race. That just had to do with a, a small community understanding of not letting outsiders in. Right. So then it does connect to racism, right? Because that's a lot of what it's about. Not letting, first of all, looking at brown and black people as, they're, as, as outsiders and like right. they're not welcome to come in, right? We're not, we cannot benefit from the same um, um, things that others have benefited from and also, also um, that has a lot to do with the understanding, again, that we are lesser human, you know, lesser human beings. Like there, there's human beings, but there are some that are greater. There are some that are lesser than others. And history will show um, that th that was tried, scientifically, that was trying to be, that was, they were trying to prove that, right? There was a lot of scientific studies done on brown and black people and a lot of untruths came from out of that. And, but from those kind of experiments and, and even um, just the way they dehumanize people, um, black and brown people, some people really believe that. You know, Isn't some phrenology, like what they used to do where they would like measure people's skull <laughs> and be like, this means your brain is bigger and that therefore yeah. better, or this is, you know, and this was, legitimate science in right. quote unquote legitimate science yes at the time yes and of course now we know that that is completely no, wrong that but most it, people know <laughs> that that's not true but when you look at it those kind of things people still base their arguments on because for some people well science proved that even though science was wrong and it really didn't prove that of course they um, twisted it and distorted it so that it can fit their narrative and that's what people don't understand so people have to want to know the truth and and that comes with educating yourself and one thing I find about um, a lot of people you don't want to take the time to educate yourself right um, it's easier just to go along with the status quo and have an understanding of, well, this is how it always was. You know, it'll get better over time. I mean, while we're saying it's been 400 years, it hasn't gotten better. Can you please help us? And so to get back to what people can do, um, there's a word in the Greek language, um, metanoia, which um, for us, um, if you read the Bible or, or, or if you're just a person of faith, um, translate to the word repentance, right? So it's not enough just to say you're sorry, but you have to say you're sorry in such a way that you put action to it. And the main action I feel people need to do is to allow for a change of heart and a change of your mind, so much so that transformation can occur in your life so that you can, you know, go deeper than just feeling bad about any wrongs that you might have done or other people have done and really begin to take that action to make this a better world and a peaceful world for all people. Um, but we know that is definitely <laughs> easier said than done. And right. so I encourage people, you know, to do the hard work. You know, everybody wants to go out there and march. Everybody wants to hold up signs and we need that. But we really need you to start with your heart. And because once you start with your heart, we need you to join in with those people that are trying to, like myself, that want to tear down 
this systemic system that allows for racism to still exist in this country and abroad. I mean, it's time to eradicate racism overall. And again, it's gonna start with a transformation of people's hearts and minds to not see black and brown people other than what we are, human. <laughs> We're not a skin color, we're human. Yes, our skin tones are different, we get that. But you know, at the essence of, of all of this, we are human beings trying to learn the best way to navigate upon the earth. Which is what we're all doing. And I, I, I really struck with what you were saying before about the insidious nature of racism. Because the sneaky way that you can get away with it, because as a white person, my life can totally suck sometimes. And I, you know, and I, you know, this, but that doesn't mean that I have suffered the way that a, a black or brown person has suffered in terms of a systemic way. Yeah. That's sort of like a, everybody's life is sort of bad at periods. Yes. <laughs> you know, yes. as opposed to there's a almost a, and I can think of it as a, as a feminist and as somebody who is a women's studies major that I'm like still waiting for like the, okay, next, can we get to women? <laughs> <laughs> and right, stop seeing all like the broken faces at the beginning yes. of the pandemic and everything. Yeah. Not that, but it, I think it all is going to happen hopefully together and, and with your, the thing you're talking about transformation. But I do think that the idea of privilege is very new to people. And it's like, it's like sort of getting in, you know, there, like seeping right. in, but it's hard. It is hard because I would think and I'm, you know, taking a stab at it, you didn't necessarily see yourself as privileged. You probably just saw that this is, this is how it was. This is just how it is. And then weigh it out or balance it out, you know, because I hear um, um, from um, um, my, my Caucasian brothers and sisters all the time, you know, we work hard, we study hard, um, you know, we have humble beginnings and humble life. And so, you know, you see yourself just as good people doing what you're supposed to do. So with that comes where I try to tell people, we don't need any more good people in this world, right? <laughs> we, we get it. Good people often become comfortable and complacent, right? We need God-fearing, God-loving, God-speed people that are willing to really go out there and not only be concerned about their comfortability, but be concerned about the comfort of others. And if others are not comforted, then that means you shouldn't be as comfortable as you are because that means there has to be some kind of breakdown in the system. And, and so that, that's what I would say. say. So How do you this teach word that privilege, to people? Huh? How do you teach that to people, especially in a world where, I mean, where we all don't go to church anymore? Right. Right. How do you get this? I mean, is it a media thing? Is it a social media thing? How do you get people to, to get there? Because like you were saying, I do, I do all the right things. I'm a, I'm a good person. I, you know, why should they get a privilege um, to go to Harvard when I, I'm just as good? You know what I mean? I just did a play about that, actually. Um, that, and, and I think that that's where, I don't know how you get to, you have to care about other people. <laughs> in a world where we don't have God in many places. Right. And, and a, or a, um, a moral code that is universal. And my, I might be wrong. I hope I'm wrong. I, I, I think the overall, so we have the human condition. And so that's what brings us together. So, so somewhere in, in there, people can associate with other people's pain, right? And other people's sorrow. We, we see it all the time. And people do. We, we have a lot of compassion when things happen to other living creatures, uh, dull animals. And, and so, so we know we have that ability to do it. But you have to want to do it in those spaces and places that might be uncomfortable for you, right? You have to start somewhere. So you have to start sometimes. It is an apology. It is um, just extending yourself to someone else. It is doing your due diligence. And you know what? I'm going to read about this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open up a book. I'm going to order books. I'm going to ask questions. I'm going to inform myself so I can be a better person, right? I'm not going to just listen to what everybody else is saying. I'm going to go and educate myself so that I know that I am doing what is right. So that's what a person that has God or doesn't believe in God, most of us know right from wrong. 
Right. There are right. universal truths. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I would hope, I mean, some people get right. it really twisted, but most of us at the heart of it know what's right and wrong behavior. Right. So I think you start with yourself and then the more you educate yourself, you know, you share it and you spread it to other people and you take a stand and you take some action steps where you can. You know, we had a um, protest and I'll just end with that. Um, they had a peaceful protest, which is more of the vigil for um, George Floyd in Southampton, Aguam Park. And one of the things I said is, you know, you can do so much. You just have to be willing to do it. For instance, you can stop supporting institutions and organizations that are blatantly racist, that haven't had a problem to pretty much state <laughs> this is how they are. Pull your money from there. Stop going to shop and buy from those spaces and places. Your monies that are invested, what kind of organizations and corporations are they invested in? Are they invested in people that have the same moral values and compass that you do? And if not, be willing to pull your money from those places because that's how you start to shut down the system, right? So there's things we all can do, um, but we just, we just have to really get up and do it. Yeah. Um, so I'm sorry to hear that you're going to be leaving the area. I am. Just as we sort of were getting to know each other and we did a wonderful reading together and I was so impressed with you and, Thank um, you. yeah. And so I, um, I'm so sorry to hear that. I really am. I've like broken up about it. I'm, uh, so thank you for your service yeah. out here. Um, thank and you. For being such a, such a leader. Cause I know you are. And the first thing I heard about you when I heard about you was there's this amazing woman oh, at wow. the um, Hamptons Methodist, United, United Methodist Church. And I wasn't actually, and I promise what I heard was there's a wonderful woman. I didn't hear black woman. Wow. <laughs> I didn't have any idea. Wow. Um, and then when I met you, I was like, oh, fantastic. This is, <laughs> this is the person they were talking about. Yes. Um, so anyway, I really appreciate it. And I, um, I have one quick question before sure. we leave. Um, about COVID-19 and the protesting, do you have any suggestions for people, everybody? It is hard, I don't know what to say. It, it. is, I, you know, um, Sharon, that I was at the protest yesterday, I was so uncomfortable. I had to rethink it so many times for a lot of reasons, but also because of COVID, because I'm gonna be honest, I am one of those persons that have been sheltering in, at home, in place. Um, if I go out, I stay in my car. I won't even go into the store. I only allow my husband <laughs> to do certain things um, because I'm just so concerned with one, catching it and then, you know, having one of my family members to get it. Right. Um, I think that needs to be looked at greatly um, because it's very hard to social distance in a protest. Um, people are wearing their masks, which is helpful, but some aren't. And then you have people passing a mic or going up to the mic, uh, which, you know, which we need to really be careful. We need to stay mindful. And it's not like since we're dealing with the virus of racism, that means the virus COVID is no longer in existence. And unfortunately, I think we're going to have an, a, a lot more cases um, in, in, in a couple of weeks or a month or so um, because not only of the protests, but just it's summertime. <laughs> And people are just out on the beaches, out in the parks, and they are just tired of sheltering in place. Yep. And I well, wish you please don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> We've been talking about that a lot, but um, but it's hard, you know. Yeah. And everybody also wants to get out, but they also want to show that show their support, and we get yes. it. But then we're in the middle of the pandemic. It's and so right. I would say I think it's going to get worse before it gets better. You know, I think sometimes this is the quiet before the storm on both and both for both viruses. Right. <laughs> you know, like this is maybe somewhat of a quiet before a storm. Dr. Leslie, thank you so very much. You're so welcome. Thank you for having me. It was a delight. It was wonderful. And I'll, and I'll hopefully see you before you leave. That's what I'm trying my best to do with so many people, but I said it may have to be virtually. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna show up in one of your in one of your sermons before you leave. That's what I'm gonna okay, do. Okay, do that. Okay. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. Um all right. Bye bye. Bye. Take care.